Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ali Ha'eri from Cubal. And uh, first and foremost, just want to thank everyone for tuning in today. Uh, we've got a fantastic webinar uh, for you folks today. We're joined by our uh, friends at Forrester to talk about big data in the cloud. Um, before we get into introduction, just want to let you know a couple of things. Uh, first, if you have any sort of question over the course of this presentation, uh, you should see a chat window in the bottom left of your screen. Please feel free to ask your questions uh, down there. Uh, we'll collect those, and at the end of the presentation, we'll do about 10 minutes or so of Q&A. So um, just go ahead and ask those as they come up, and we'll take care of addressing as many as we can at the end. Um, also, we'll be sending out a, uh, an on-demand version of this webinar uh, probably about tomorrow. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. In case you miss anything, you could be able, you'll be able to uh, watch everything again. Uh, with that being said, today's webinar is about big data in the cloud, and uh, we, we picked two of the best people to talk about such a subject. Um, our first presenter is Noel Johanna, who is a principal analyst of enterprise architecture at Forrester Research. He's got over 25 years of experience in IT and has held various technical and management positions. Um, we've also got Ashish Thusu, who is co-founder and CEO of Cubal. Um, some of you may know Ashish as uh, working on Facebook's data infrastructure team uh, prior to uh, founding Cubal. Uh, and it was over there where they built one of the largest data processing and analytic platforms uh, in the world. I mean, what better place as a use case for uh, big data than Facebook? So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass it along to Noel. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me um, on this webinar. Um, I guess, you know, I believe we are living in a very uh, exciting time when it comes to data. Uh, just a few decades ago, not too far away, maybe 30 years ago, um, we were dealing with data on paper. Uh, it, it was a challenge, right? The data was only in one sheet of paper. We couldn't really make use of the data. And uh, today, we have lots and lots of data, right? Whether it's uh, consumer data, whether it's an enterprise data, and, and definitely uh, data is driving this new innovation from what we see with customers today. Uh, it's driving some new products and innovation, better services to the customer, better customer satisfaction, and, and all, all the things uh, above that as well, right? So, so data actually changes the way business operates, you know. The data has become critical to every organization. Now, if you look at big data, I mean, you know, big data is, um, is obviously data that's humongous, you know, large, especially could be all data sets which have grown significantly in your warehouses, in your databases, um, but it could, can also be new data sets, right, coming in from, say, sensor data or cloud sources or could be log files or clickstream data so, or Internet of Things, right? So this is the amount of data coming in. So this data was never, ever stored before. They were in files, actually, if at all they were. And it was a challenge to store them in a file because you can't really do anything additional uh, analysis on those files, right? So I think the evolution uh, from data to big data is important to every organization. If you are not on a journey of big data today, um, you could be actually outbeaten by your competitor in the coming years. You really have to have a strategy uh, on big data. So what I'm going to cover today is about big data in the cloud. You know, why should we care about big data in the cloud? And uh, this is something new. Obviously, we haven't, haven't done big data as much in the cloud, and, and I'll talk to you through some of the things about what we are hearing from customers and what's the importance around big data. Now, if you look at it, there are about 7 billion people today, and a lot of people have these devices, smart devices, smartphones today. In fact, billions of cell phones today already exist, right? And, and obviously, that, that creates so much volumes of data. Now, that data actually is what needs to be analyzed further to do better types of analytics, predictive analytics, so doing some sort of a real-time analytics to do 
better customer service, better retention of customers as well. In fact, we believe you're going to have about 50 billion devices, the sensors and devices uh, in the next five years, not too far away from here. Right? We're going to have all those variables and all the other things generating a lot of data. That's huge. Now, overall, based on our research, we found that uh, there's about 3.5 zettabytes, zettabytes of data on public net, whether it's coming from uh, video surveillance or coming in from different Hadoop systems or from ERB systems or social media, Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, in fact, 80% of data today is already living outside your data center. A lot less data is being generated inside your data center. Outside of your data center is definitely the where most of the activity is going. Right? So definitely there's a huge amount of data. And you've got to start to look at your strategy differently. You can't just continue with the same data management strategy, what you have had for decades, and continue to evolve right? and, and hope that, hey, we'll solve the big data problem. Maybe not. Maybe you've got to look at a different angle of it. How can you actually do a better job in supporting it? Now, Based on our research, what's interesting is, you know, if you look at this chart, uh, a typical iceberg has about 20% of the visible iceberg on top of the water. Right? 80% of the iceberg is, is below the water, actually. <laughs> right? Similarly to data, actually, what's interesting. In fact, we are using only about 22% of data today in, in most organizations. Uh, this is for the analytical requirements and insights, only about 20%. What happened to the 80%? Well, it gets locked up into all these silos in these different files because we can't put this into a warehouse, first of all, because the warehouse itself can't handle so much growth. So the current utilized data in, in most organizations is about 20 22%. And, you know, that isn't going anywhere, right? I mean, that's where we are. What we found in, in um, recent surveys we've done is that customers who actually use more data are likely to make a better decision about the company. And, and that actually uh, improves the bottom line in terms of revenue, in terms of delivering innovation. The more data you use, the better prediction you can do, the better insights you can get, which you couldn't do before. Right? So this is definitely something which uh, organizations should be looking at it, as how we can we uh, use more data. Now, I guess you, if you take the equation, and, and like the example of an iceberg and flip the iceberg. I don't think, I don't think it's technically possible to, to flip an iceberg. If it's small, maybe. But um, if we do it for data, we could. What if we can really exploit about 70 to 80% of data? That changes everything. Now, the question, question is, how can we do that? Well, we have newer technologies today like Hadoop and Hadoop ecosystem to exploit such data. Right, uh, traditional architectures and, and architectures and data management um, features and functionality have limited us in doing that. But obviously, with the big data like Hadoop platforms, definitely you can do a lot more. So this is an uh, approach. I think organizations start, should start looking at it: is to look at other data available and how that data could be used uh, with things like technology like Hadoop in this regard. Now. We at Forrester categorize big data into three buckets. You know, uh, you obviously um, structured data, uh, unstructured data, and binary data. Uh, structured data, obviously, technically is like the XML data, the relational data, file data. Unstructured being a bit more free format tweets and emails, and then obviously binary, which is more like video, um, images, and audio. Now these are all important when it comes to big data. No, it's all about data. Remember that it's not about Structured data separate, unstructured data separate, binary data separate. It's all business data. Why can't we just have a single view of that business data, right? Now, Forrester's definition of big data is about the practices and processes and technologies that close the gap between data available and the ability to turn data into business insights, right? So that actually is uh, an area where, obviously, it's not about just one area. You've got to look at also the practices, the processes, and technology together, which makes it more appealing, and how we can turn those into a business insights, which is, does a better job than what we've done in the past. Right? We had limited data 
and limited availability of data and limited uh, utilization of data. With big data, you, ex you expose more data to business user. They can make better decisions and definitely uh, helps customer innovate as well. Now, big data obviously uses more available today than ever before, right? Yesterday we had very expensive data. Uh, it was not as difficult to manage this limited amount of data. And, and today we are obviously moving towards a better and cheaper and faster approaches to doing this, right? I think the more important thing is, can we really self-service this data platform? And, and self-service means that using the data so that uh, business users could actually exploit the data themselves as opposed to IT servicing the data to the business users, what we've done in the past. Instead of looking at the bottom up, we look at the top down approach, where the business users can also exploit this. Now this is where we are heading towards in a more self-service uh, focus. L we're being concerned less about the te technology, more about the business data and understanding the customers is more important. If we, if we just play around with technology, we can do that for decades <laughs> and get nowhere. But really, we have to actually do, uh, no, focus less on the technology in terms of better automation we need, right? Better facilities we need, as opposed to uh, looking at what the data actually holds for the organization and for the customer, right? So business data, I mean, uh, big data is driving new insights and new possibilities that we couldn't do before. I think this is exactly what we see in the retail, the healthcare, the financial services, the banks, the insurance companies today. Um, you know, we, we at Forrester deal with a lot of these customers on a regular basis and, and you know, all of these guys are actually preparing to build these new models, new analytical models as well as predictive to do you know, better business with customers and, and even uh, tap into new opportunities which you haven't done before. Now example is that if you have big data, right, what can you do with it? Well, you can help prevent churn. This is a very important to topic uh, for a lot of companies out there. How can we retain customers today? In fact, not, not imp uh, getting more customers, but also retaining customers is equally important. Today, you can, a customer can switch products very easily through the, through the conversation with the customers, I mean, to other customers, to the friends and families. So you need to understand this data. Right? You need to understand if the customer is thinking about uh, churning, I mean, what do you do, I guess, right? How can you actually prevent that from happening? And that data may be available in, in social media data like Twitter and Facebook, so you really need to have tied the knots together. Another example is Netflix. You know, how can actually Netflix deliver uh, better recommendations for you for your movies, right? Understanding your likes and dislikes um, is important. But also uh, you know, looking at the trends as to if at all this person liked that movie, I'm sure you would also like that movie, right? So based on all these things of uh, analytical and predictive models is, is critical. Now, the more data they have, the better prediction they can make. Right? This is important. And this is all about big data, right? How can you actually accomplish that? In fact, uh, in the UK, a supermarket can predict exactly the date customers will return. <laughs> and when they will spend within $10 of 19% 19 of the customers. So it's again, some models they can, they can detect, detect as to what is the customer buying and when do they buy that and what kind of things they are, they're looking for, right? So they can actually offer them discounts, right? Send them a, a, a text, send them an email on their devices and hey, by the way, we can give you more discounts if at all you are look, interested in this product, right? So there's a lot of these opportunities and potentials out there. And it's all the age of the customer, you know. <laughs> Traditionally, we have deal with, uh, dealing with uh, age of the customer like where, where all of the customers were in, a, were in a category called customers, right? Today, it's all about personalization. It's about Tom and John and Mary. It's about the individual customer. How can you actually deliver more value to that, to that individual customer? And that individual customer has data. The data is sitting on premise, but also in the cloud. So if you, if you multiply all of these customer data across all of the customer base you have, that's huge. You really have to start to understand the data patterns between on-premise and the cloud and try to give you a big factor. Like Starbucks and Facebooks and JetBlue, all these guys are giving personalization today. Right? These are important areas. An example is a retailer where, where this retailer actually uh, provides you alerts to a customer if at all it's uh, you know, geo 
uh, spatial data and, and geolocation data is enabled. In other words, if, you move, if a customer goes to the mall, automatically an alert comes up and says, by the way, you were looking for a pair of jeans for the last few months. We'll give you a 50% discount on these jeans uh, on the storeroom, which is about 50 feet away from you, right? That actually changes the way you deliver data. We have never, ever done that before. Right? Question is, how is your architecture going to change because of those personalization? Right? Um, now, what's interesting in this, based on the conversation we've had uh, with customers over the last few years, big data implementations are often not straightforward. It's, it's very complex administration. You've got to train your folks. You're trying your skill, your, your enhance the skills for administrators. You've got to improve the, the quality of experiences, what they're having. But it's a lot of cost involved in this. Right? You've got to buy the right hardware. You've got to buy the multiple nodes in a cluster. All of these clusters sometimes have to be identical in terms of RAM and storage and disk drives. <laughs> but it's a lot of challenging kind of things. You've got to understand the capacity you need. Do you need to buy five nodes, 10 nodes, 1,000 nodes, 10,000 nodes? I don't know. Right? How many use cases are you going to deal with? You don't know. This is actually true for all of the banks, insurance companies, retailers, manufacturing, you name it. Every organization is struggling with some of these things. You, you don't want to over-provision a system because you may be wasting your money like this for, for nothing, right? You may be over-provisioning a, a system which may be a thousand nodes uh, which may not be utilized for the next two years. Or you may be under-provisioning it because you may be having a requirement more than 1,000 nodes, right? Sometimes it's time-consuming. A lot of people are spending not days, months, sometimes a year or more trying to figure this out. Right? Big data is not straightforward. And you want results, you will not get it tomorrow. You're not going to get it with it for months, actually. Right? You've got to learn, understand all of these protocols, the programming languages, you've got to do the scripts. And obviously the security and governance is a bigger factor in, in organization as well. You may be dealing with sensitive data. All of that data gets ex exposed to all of these various administrators, architects, developers. How are you going to control that? Right? So big data in the cloud, we believe, overcomes these challenges. How? Well, first of all, it's got lower cost. You are sharing the infrastructure, storage, memory, uh, network bandwidth, which actually offers you a better choices that you don't really have to enable uh, some of these things which you are doing uh, in traditional sense, right? So basically, you don't have to buy all of the hardware you have to buy. <laughs> you can buy it in a gradual, incremental, on-demand scale. It's faster time to value. We've heard from customers, within a few days, they have the big data projects running. <laughs> compared to months in organizations which you do on-premise. So cloud actually enables faster time to value, which I think is critical. Time is of essence today than ever before. You're going to be spending six months trying to build this Hadoop cluster. You want it like now, right? Automation and simplification is critical. You want something which is automated and simplified, not just basically doing um, no, manual work involved in this, right? More use cases. The, more, the biggest problem I think today which the industry is facing is that not knowing what is the best use case for their respective industries uh, for big data. This is time and again, I think the more use cases you, you, you use in big data, you'll understand the value of it, right? So you, you should actually have parallel use cases emerge, which means that you have to use multiple uh, Hadoop clusters trying to use this environment, right? Uh, On-demand scale is important, controlled, governance, security. Now, people say that, well, cloud security is not good. And, and I would say, you know, it was not good <laughs> five years ago, four years ago, where we were still improving security on, on the cloud. Today, it's got, in fact, they are, they are customers in, in the financial services industries which are moving to the cloud. And the real reason is better security, actually. It's the other way around. In fact, they, they, have, a, they have a guard, a security guard sitting outside <laughs> Uh, these cloud providers, right? Multiple security guards and, and, and security. In some of these data centers, in, in customer data centers, you don't even have that. Imagine that. You also have better control for physical security and, and, and also logical security as well. So definitely it offers you better governance protection as well. And then obviously 
you can do new predictive real-time insights uh, with cloud, which uh, was difficult to do in, in previous terms. Um, so where do we see cloud services growing in the next um, five, six years? Uh, today it's about $72 billion in terms of cloud applications, SaaS solutions, infrastructures uh, as a service, storage, file services, integration, you name it. And the cloud is about $72 billion, $72 billion being spent in the cloud, whether it's from storage, from files, from integration, from SaaS, from applications, from databases, you name it, $72 billion. That will grow to about $200 billion by 2020. This is the Forrester's kind of report, if you're interested in more details on that. Huge growth happening, more than doubles in the next five years. So definitely this is an area which I think uh, you're going to see a lot more happening. In fact, a lot of people are looking at the cloud uh, just for that reason, to be able to deliver more value uh, to the business and, and faster time to value um, as well. Now, if you look at the spending in IT spending, right, um, the traditional platforms in 2011, we spent a lot more dollars on traditional data platforms. When it's like traditional data platforms, you're talking about databases, data warehouses, what have you. Only about 12% of the spending were on these areas, right? Uh, which is more on the system of engagement, which is where the data are like uh, geospatial data, geolocation data, clickstream data, uh, log analysis data was coming in. But now that's changing. We're seeing less data around the traditional platforms, more from the systems of engagement, like the mobile devices, the sensors, the Internet of Things. In fact, going forward, you're going to see a lot more spending around this system of engagement. And by 2017, about 65% of your IT spending will be around this big data system of engagement spending, uh, which is huge. So you should really start to look at your architectures and, and your budgets about where you're going to spend around this. You know. Um, so how do you compare, I guess, uh, big data um, deployments on-premise with the cloud? First of all, definitely, I guess, you know, on-premise, you are spending a lot of uh, dollars for, could be moderate to high. I know organizations are spend, spending the best of the best hardware, storage, memory for on-premise. It's huge dollars you've got to spend uh, trying to get this big data uh, Hadoop platforms to be enabled. Whereas in the cloud, you don't really have to. You, you, you are using, I guess, the amount of storage and servers and CPU based on your requirements. Um, not necessarily over-provisioning some of these or under-provisioning them, right? It's elastic, on-demand scale, which I think is important. On-premise, there's nothing called an on-demand scale. If you only had, say, 100, 100 nodes in a cluster, well, you only have 100 nodes in a cluster. If I need to add another 50 more, well, you've got to go and buy. After two months later, you'll probably get those servers and connect them. Here, it's in seconds in the cloud. It's elastic. Why wouldn't you use that, right? It's also automation, right? I mean, the good thing with cloud is that it's comprehensive. It's all built into the platform, which I think enables more use cases than ever before, right? Security-wise, I would say, obviously, people have concerns that, well, on-premise security um, is good, but obviously sometimes it requires more controls where you've got to enable this and that and auditing and monitoring and encryption and vulnerability assessments and access controls. Cloud already offers that. It offers you already built-in monitoring, built-in auditing, encryption for network, which I think helps a lot of customers as well. So I would say even though cloud is still in a concern for organizations, and I think that concern will, will still be there maybe in the coming years, but has declined significantly over the last five years. You know? I think 80% of the people were concerned about uh, cloud security. Today is like less than 50%, I would say. And that number is actually declining rapidly. I think as you start to deploy more uh, implementation in the public cloud, you're going to see a lot more people adopting the cloud. And, you know, the best way to look at it is that if you really have sensitive data, I would encourage you to look at data at rest encryption, data in motion encryption, and, and enable auditing to make sure that your data is protected. And maybe you want to start maybe with first with non-sensitive data before you move sensitive data as well. So you don't really necessarily have to move sensitive data initially, right? High availability in on-premise requires a lot of HADR. In fact, only about 20% of enterprises today really have a HADR strategy today for big data. 
only 20 percent. Why? It's expensive. They don't, they don't even figure it out to how to do on-premise production systems for availability. Forget about the DR part of it. Cloud, it's built in. Day one, for the minute you go and you swipe, uh, kind of uh, start using uh, these environments, right? Faster time to value. I think this is uh, the biggest element with, with on-premise in the cloud is that it's fast time to value um, with, um, with the cloud. There's no time wasted. You can start getting, uh, getting used to this environment right away. So overall, I think, you know, I would say big data in the cloud is something to consider. Definitely for these dynamic new use cases which are emerging where you don't have resources, we don't have people to, uh, to spend on this, and you need to obviously have faster results, it's worth trying it. And you don't necessarily have to put all data in the cloud. Start gradually, incrementally seeing exactly what the value is. Uh, we have come across data warehouses today, you would not believe, running into petabytes. People are like, shot what? Petabytes in the cloud? Are you serious? <laughs> yes. We have come across hundreds of customers today already running petabytes, petabytes in the cloud. That's huge. So even though, you know, maybe five years ago we only had maybe a 10 terabyte <laughs> instance running in the cloud, today we have petabytes. Definitely, I think as we progress further, we're going to have even further and, and beyond petabytes in the cloud as well. So definitely something to consider uh, as well. I guess uh, with that, uh, uh, I'll send it over to um, Ashish for his comments. Thanks, Noel, uh, for a fantastic uh, presentation on uh, big data use cases as well as uh, how cloud enables uh, organizations to get there quickly. Uh, you know, it is a, it is a fascinating presentation. Um, folks, I'll be focusing a lot more on some of the details that, uh, uh, that uh, support, uh, you know, a lot of the claims that Noel made in, in their presentation. Uh, so first, a uh, little bit of a brief introduction about Kubol. Kubol is essentially big data as a service. It's a cloud platform built around Hadoop and its related technologies, all hosted in uh, clouds of your choice, whether it's the AWS uh, or Amazon Cloud or Google Compute or Azure. And all of it is provided as a turnkey data infrastructure. So you can go and start using these technologies uh, to uh, get insights out of, their, out of your data or to put your data to business use as opposed to uh, struggling with the plumbing or the infrastructure. Uh, so from that vantage point, uh, we have been uh, involved with, uh, uh, with big data and the cloud since the very beginning, since the last three years, and have, over the course of a period of time, uh, developed, a lot of, uh, developed our perspective uh, on the market and also developed uh, a lot of um, uh, intelligence around uh, how cloud helps accelerate uh, Hadoop types of technologies uh, and starts moving them out from, um, you know, your POCs or lab environments to more production use cases very, very quickly. Um, so let me start by um, talking about the emergence of Hadoop. A lot of us, uh, so this is a slightly different perspective, a lot of us associate Hadoop and big data with uh, lots of data, lots of processing power, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that has been possible. Hadoop has made it possible to have that at low cost by using uh, uh, you know, commodity hardware and building in scalability and incremental scalability in the infrastructure. But what also uh, people overlook is that because of that, uh, those properties, because of the properties of being able to operate at, uh, with commodity hardware and uh, high scalability, Hadoop perhaps also offers infrastructure which can help um, uh, support a lot of users running their computation or their queries or their transformation in the enterprise. So now we have uh, at our disposal not just an infrastructure that can process lots of data, but it's also an infrastructure that can process lots of computation and do that in a way so that uh, we can uh, start bringing uh, the power of computation also closer to the users, which is the first step towards democratization of data processing. Uh, so that is one perspective that I wanted to give around Hadoop. Uh, however, as Noel mentioned, uh, we also discovered that there are a lot of impediments that organizations hit 
uh, while getting to this picture. While uh, you know the, the the big picture is you know provide the data to be at the fingertips of the data users in the enterprise, but in order to get to that goal, a lot of organizations hit a lot of impediments. Uh, some of these are as follows. Uh, these are all, uh, you know, impediments starting from day one to uh, towards the end goal of uh, enabling accessibility. But even on day one itself, the first, uh, you know, first impediment is investment risk. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, especially if you are running these, uh, you know, Hadoop systems on prem, the first step has uh, is always uh, around what kind of capital outlay do I have to make in order to get these clusters in place so that I can start uh, you know, having enough uh, compute power or enough storage uh, or enough infrastructure to support some of my use cases or do a POC around it. Immediately after that, the risk moves towards execution risk. As you know, this technology is always changing. Um, and uh, in that scenario, uh, you, know, you have to uh, train uh, a lot of your uh, staff in order to get to a place where they can put together this infrastructure um, so that you can get to the starting line of, again, uh, let me start to do my POC on my data. Once organizations overcome that, uh, then it becomes, okay, my, uh, the, the conversation becomes like, okay, my POC has been successful, I found a use case, I want to productionize it and operationalize the technology. And in that stage, again, because of the rapidly changing uh, environment of the technology stack, as well as uh, the need for uh, expansion of infrastructure itself uh, during operationalization, all these, uh, all the things that Noel mentioned come into play. You know, do I need more servers? Do I need to uh, implement an HA or a DR strategy? Um, and that also becomes a, yet another impediment that the uh, uh, enterprises have to cross before they can actually put uh, things into production. And finally, once you have crossed those impediments, the big, uh, the, the final frontier becomes how do I enable access to data to all my enterprise users? Uh, how do I move away from the old school uh, data back office model of, uh, you know, uh, brokering access to data through a team to my data users as opposed to making it self-service and uh, fully accessible to anybody who wants to, anybody in any data user in the enterprise who wants to use data for decision-making uh, uh, process or for deriving insights and so on and so forth. So companies constantly struggle with one or multiple of these uh, things uh, in their quest towards getting to a system where big data becomes uh, big data and big data pr uh, processing becomes that much more pervasive and accessible to their data users. Um, this is where uh, the benefits of the cloud come into play. We know that cloud is on-demand and turnkey infrastructure. So uh, it, is, um, it, it has these capabilities which allow you to get 10 nodes or 1,000 nodes in a matter of minutes. Uh, it has the capability of being completely turnkey. You just uh, create your credentials, and then you have the infrastructure at your disposal. At the same time, the cloud infrastructure is extremely flexible and adaptive, uh, by uh, you know which can support growing workloads as well as differing workloads. Uh, you know whether you have to scale down your infrastructure for your workloads or scale it up, uh, cloud can support it. But more fundamentally, suppose your workloads change so that now they need more memory or they need more um, compute. You have at your disposal in the cloud to completely change your infrastructure to suit the needs of your uh, workloads. This is very different from um, uh, you know, how uh, we, are, uh, we, are, you know, we have been taught to think in uh, on-prem fixed, uh, fixed infrastructure kind of a world. The third part is, since the cloud is, you know, has been, especially the public clouds have been created from outside in into the organization, they are from the day one um, accessible across multiple geographies and multiple regions, and uh, the whole paradigm is around self-service in, in the cloud environment. That is, those are the three uh, big benefits of the cloud. And if you think about it, these counteract to the impediments that I mentioned previously. Uh, so, my position there is that if you combine Hadoop, uh, sorry, uh, combine big data and the cloud, you can enable enterprises 
to really move the impediments out of the way uh, and so, so that they can really discover, accelerate, and productionize big data use cases uh, that much more quickly in, that much, uh, you know, in a very agile way, in a very flexible way, with a lot of confidence and very, very little risk of failure. So that is the thesis around, uh, around Kubol as well. And that is our fundamental thesis that bring all the benefits of the cloud to big data uh, to really help enterprises throughout the entire life cycle of a big data project, whether it's discovery, whether it is uh, acceleration, or whether it is productionization of those big data use cases. I'll give you some simple examples, uh, you know, especially around the impediment of uh, de-risking Hadoop and, you know, uh, upfront in, from both the investment perspective as well as from the execution perspective. Uh, why, during my days at Facebook, while building out uh, their uh, Hadoop infrastructure and the data infrastructure from 2007-2011, uh, this chart sort of captures the amount of data under storage uh, you know, in Facebook. Uh, we reached a cluster that, uh, which, were about, which had about um, uh, 15 petabytes of compressed data um, towards 2011, those clusters are even bigger now in exabytes. But the start was with an 18-node POC cluster that grew to 3,000 nodes. It took us about three months to get our cluster in place. And it took us another uh, nine months to make this platform truly strategic so that it could become uh, accessible to a lot of users within the company, so that it could really change the DNA of the company to become that much data driven by putting data in the hands of the users. Now compare and contrast that with uh, a you know, cloud-based Hadoop service uh, like Kubol. Today uh, we process, uh, you know, uh, just last month they were, we processed around 80 petabytes of data in a single month. And this entire powerful infrastructure is available with a zero upfront investment in infrastructure instantaneous scaling, and as a result of this, from day one, you can make this infrastructure become very strategic uh, to your data use cases and become that much more central to the data use cases so that uh, you know, users, your data users can get access to this very, very easily uh, and uh, can start using it without having to bother about going through the Past that Facebook went, you know, spending an hour, uh, you know, nine to twelve months to get, just get to a place where it would become a strategic infrastructure. That's a huge amount of uh, benefit that a cloud-based service brings uh, by reducing the upfront investment as well as reducing the risk of execution uh, in order to get uh, to that uh, stage. Additionally, as you know, the, there are a lot of moving parts and uh, open source technologies that are needed to really create, uh, you know, Hadoop is a, uh, is a part of it, and there are a lot of other infrastructure projects uh, that need, uh, in the Hadoop umbrella itself, which need to be integrated um, before you get to a place where it starts becoming a strategic platform, where it starts becoming a self-service, ubiquitous access kind of a platform for your data users. Again, in the cloud world, all this is pre-integrated. The platform is completely uh, turnkey. Uh, again, uh, this uh, fact, this pre-integration and the fact that all the best practices are already built into the infrastructure um, and you don't have to go through a discovery process to discover those best practices uh, also reduce the execution risk quite dramatically uh, and uh, make that, uh, you know, make the final vision of um, a very uh, central platform which can enable data access to a lot of users in the enterprise that much more real and that much more quicker to achieve. Um, once you get to uh, that level, uh, the day-to-day -day challenges of running uh, data infrastructure are around operationalization. And there are three major reasons why uh, this becomes challenging, apart from the fact that you have to obviously uh, get and train your staff uh, to be dealing with this infrastructure. Uh, the three big reasons are that if this infrastructure becomes central to your uh, use cases, uh, it grows pretty rapidly. Uh, and it grows pretty rapidly from the fact that people discover a lot of different use cases around data using the infrastructure, and therefore the demand for this infrastructure uh, keeps growing. 
Uh, it also, uh, you know, managing unpredictability is also very, very important. Um, today's environments are very agile. Uh, you know, it's a very, very rapidly changing world. As a result, this gets uh, reflected into changing workloads, into changing types of computation that you want to do. And, uh, you know, managing that unpredictability and making sure that your infrastructure is up to the task is also very, very hard while operationalizing these systems. And finally, managing open source, which is a constant source of innovation and, um, uh, you know, continuous movement there, being on top of it, is also very, very challenging for teams uh, who are tasked with creating a platform for uh, widespread data access and, wide, you know, uh, around big data uh, in an enterprise. Again, a cloud-based set of service makes these things very, very easy. To start with, uh, you know, platforms such as Kubol are self-managing uh, in the sense that uh, they dynamically grow the infrastructure or shrink the infrastructure depending upon your need. As a result, uh, growth becomes very, very easy to manage and control. Um, the cloud being flexible and elastic allows your infrastructure, as I mentioned previously, to adapt to your use cases uh, you know, uh, in a way that uh, your use cases can benefit from the adaptive infrastructure as opposed to the other way around where use cases are um, uh, caged by the infrastructure or the capabilities of infrastructure. And of course, uh, the services themselves, since they're pre-integrated and they're always constantly monitoring open source innovation, uh, they keep bringing in a lot of open source goodness uh, into the platform itself. So uh, for all these factors, operations with a cloud-based Hadoop service becomes that much, much easier. The next part is around accessibility, around enabling access, uh, which is also uh, has traditionally been an impediment. Uh, you know, so once you uh, figure out your uh, data projects, once you operationalize your infrastructure, the next thing becomes how do I give access? Um, and this access could be spanning geographic boundaries, this access could be spanning uh, company boundaries, and so on and so forth. Cloud from day one is made to be very accessible across geographies. And by bringing this benefit to big data, from day one you can make your data infrastructure accessible to users around the world or with also users within the organization. Uh, and once you enable that access, sharing and collaboration becomes that much more easy, whether it is uh, you know, um, sharing across geographic boundaries, sharing across organizations within a particular company, or uh, more interestingly, uh, sharing across data supply chains. In many industries, there are literally supply chains around data where uh, one types of data provider you know, creates certain data sets which are used by other companies to embellish and enhance and then provide it to other companies and so on and so forth. You know, that world becomes uh, very, very easily accessible. And a lot of these data sets are big data sets. And that world becomes that much more very easily accessible when you're running a cloud-based Hadoop service uh, because the access uh, is built from the, ins from the outside in and sharing and collaboration becomes that much more easy uh, as opposed to trying to run your own infrastructure. So what are, so these are great things around uh, benefits of the cloud and how cloud can help you accelerate uh, big data use cases as well as big data access uh, within the enterprise uh, and do that in a way uh, such that the risk goes from investment as well execution is very low. But on the other hand, what are some of the objections that we have traditionally heard uh, around a cloud service? Uh, and uh, you know, Noel covered a bunch of these, I'll go a little bit more in detail. Uh, you know, traditionally, there has always been some objection around, hey, is my uh, CapEx model better or my OpEx model better? You know, uh, should I trade off uh, paying upfront um, versus paying a monthly subscription? Uh, what are, you know, does the TCO come out to be higher in one or the other? Uh, I think the right way to ask this question is to what are the dynamics uh, in the cloud that actually uh, are trending towards making TCO better. Uh, Noel talked about shared services. Also, 
the economies of scale uh, play a very, very fundamental role in enabling cloud providers to provide uh, infrastructure at, um, at lower and lower costs. And you can see that trend. It's very seminal in the, um, uh, you know, around cloud providers. Um, and um, it's just made things that much more cost effective, even at humongous scale. Noel mentioned petabytes of data being processed in, in the cloud. Even at that scale, the model, uh, the TCO model comes out to be in the favor of the cloud. Uh, in fact, there is a study from Accenture which found broadly better performance uh, for the same price while running Hadoop as a service deployments versus uh, trying to stand up their own cluster uh, on-prem. Um, uh, the link is there and you should definitely go and check it out. The second thing that people have traditionally complained about the cloud is whether security or compliance is there. Um, so again, this is, uh, there is some bit of perception here and some bit of reality. Um, uh, again, you know, um, as Noel mentioned, uh, the amount of security that a cloud provider provides to their data centers is way more than anything. Just physical security is way more than anything that a lot of other providers do. But even more fundamentally, if there is sensitive data, you can use a lot of encryption techniques uh, to uh, store data on the cloud. And uh, there are a lot of new products that have come into the market uh, which enable that as well as enable auditability uh, of your access in the cloud. And this is just a timeline of projects that Amazon uh, AWS has done around compliance and security that are captured in this slide. And you know that is constantly taking away uh, in, uh, objections around security, and I guess that is also getting reflected in some of the stats that Forrester has seen from uh, from their users around cloud security. So, um, so in a nutshell, uh, you know, big data as a service is a fast path uh, to get uh, you to big data use cases. Uh, Qbol does that by combining uh, cloud infrastructure and Hadoop player together um, to give you uh, self-managed and flexible infrastructure. And at the top, it includes a workbench as well as data governance products to control sharing, to control security, and so on and so forth, so that you can really take that infrastructure and make it that much more available, not just to your developers, but also non-developers, data users, business users within the enterprise, all in a turnkey data solution that runs in the cloud uh, and uh, makes big data that much more accessible to, data, to, the, to your data users. So I'll conclude by saying that um, uh, you know, this approach, Kubel's approach, provides a very quick path to big data platform that adapts to the needs of an organization uh, and gives a widespread access to data users while reducing costs and reducing uh, significant failure risks. With that, uh, I will conclude and uh, pass this over to Ali uh, to uh, moderate any questions. Great. Thank you to the both of you. It was a fantastic uh, presentation on both sides. Um, so yeah, we got a couple of fantastic questions over the course of the presentation and we'll kind of ping pong back and forth between Noel and Ashish. Uh, the first question is for Noel, and it asks, where does third-party data from your marketing partners fit into that data schema? Uh, you kind of showed a data schema earlier in your presentation, and someone's asking where third-party uh, data from marketing partners fits into that. Well, I mean, I guess, you know, there is, um, there is also something called big data integration, which which means that you got to integrate data from other sources, systems, and, and they may be having different schema structures and schema definitions. Uh, so there are technologies that can help you around those as well, where you may want to bring this data into the cloud as well. So it's, it applies the same approach, whether you're doing on-premise or whether you're doing in the cloud. Actually, you still have to look at how those schema definitions, schema, schema information is going to be actually utilized uh, you know, sometimes the the provider's data set may not be 
so easily integrated, so to speak, right? So if the data is coming in in a format, um, you may have to look at, you know, what are things you can tie the knots with. Now, there are obviously Hadoop technologies that actually could, can look at the data, analyze the data, to, you know, kind of look at what the, uh, how, how the data will integrate with the existing already data on the, on the Hadoop platform. But there are also tools uh, which, which can actually help you do that as well. So I, I guess you know, it, it all depends on your architecture, but I would say there's no difference as such what you would do on-premise or in the cloud. Actually, the, the same approach would apply, I guess, right? Uh, the integration is definitely a critical component uh, when you're dealing with partner data, when you're dealing with other types of source systems. Uh, someone actually has to go and start programming it or using some sort of tools to tie the data together, you know. Great. Uh, next question is for Ashish. Uh, it asks, is it advisable to go on cloud if your data size is less than one terabyte in a year? So, um, so I think the size of the data doesn't change things. Uh, size of the data might change whether you are using a big data technology or some other technology, like a Redshift or some traditional data warehousing technology. Uh, what cloud gives you is agi agility. You know, it gives you the ability to uh, really um, change your infrastructure if your uh, processing needs are changing. Suppose you are wanting to do some more advanced processing and your infrastructure needs change because of that. Cloud allows you the ability to adapt to that. A terabyte a year is uh, fairly small for um, big data use cases. But if suppose, uh, you know, uh, again, it depends upon whether this data is compressed or uncompressed and how many years of data you're holding. Uh, so irrespective of the technology that you choose to, uh, to really derive insights from that data set, cloud enables you to be very agile with those choices and enables you to be, uh, you know, it even enables you with the fact that you could try a technology uh, for that data set and if you're, uh, computation needs change or grow, and now you want to really use, you know, large, you know, b real big data technology. You can do that in a in a in a heartbeat on the cloud. Whereas on prem, uh, you really have to go through a cycle of planning and procurement and uh, identification and all that. Uh, all that, uh, all, you know, that entire cycle has to be gone through uh, if you ever need things in the future. <clears throat> Great. Um, the next question is for Noel. Uh, this, is a, this is a bit of a long question with the setup, but I think it's very interesting to ask. Um, uh, it asks, 80% of data around the data center to me is somewhat questionable, not the volume, but the value. The data in the data center is known, good, valuable data. The 80% strong across the internet, I believe, is mostly garbage. The best use for cloud and big data would seem to be to sift through this, pulling out the crumbs of value, but is it worth the cost and effort? How much of the 80% is of true business value? Uh, yeah, no, that's a very good question, actually. Um, I, I would say, you know, uh, yeah, the point taken, you know, I, I think uh, there is definitely more volume outside. Uh, the value may be low, agreed, but if you look at, Five years ago, the, val the value of that data sitting outside was very low. <laughs> Today it's low, but I think in, in, in a couple of years, we'll be see, you know, value will mod become moderate. Uh, and I, I think, you know, as we start to exploit the data more from these external sources, you'll see the value growing, you know. So I wouldn't say that the value is as high because your CRM, your master data is still equally important, right? Um, and that has to still have to tie. So you can still have a big data strategy in the cloud, and you can you can pull data in from these on-premise systems to the cloud as well, and and you can tie the knots there in the cloud. Uh, but as from the value and the volume, the volume may be sitting outside, the value may be less. But but if you look at it, uh, historically, uh, the, var the value has been very low. <laughs> uh, now it's a bit I think lower, but I think I think definitely it's improving and i think uh, in the next coming coming years you're going to see a lot more value uh, moderate value coming in from these cloud sources as well you can't even ignore those value proposition because a lot of data will be sitting outside in fact your application your mobile application will be running in the cloud actually uh, sooner or later right so all of these will churn uh, and and what do you call uh, create a lot of data 
uh, sitting outside. But historically, obviously, CRM and ERP systems actually have dominated the data sets, right? But, and I think those are still important, and they need to be tied to the, to the data. But uh, I think going forward, uh, things will change a lot, you know. All right. I think just to Great. add to that, Ali, uh, yeah. you know, Please. Noel touched on it. I think combining your internal data sets with the external data sets is where you get a lot of insights. Again, you know, um, it is about uh, the volume of the data, but it's also about independent sources of data from where you get those, you know, about the same user from independent sources if you get information. Combining that together can give you uh, a lot of uh, much better models of uh, prediction and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's not just about uh, garbage, but now at least you have systems which can sift through their garbage and give you patterns, which yep. was not possible, you know, five, ten years back. Yeah, and I agree. Um, I agree. I think, I think, you know, Ashish's point, I think, you know, that um, if you look, just look at, at, at the external data, that may not be of value. But, but when you combine external and internal data together, it creates a lot of patterns and hidden patterns which actually is difficult to gauge. Just within internal data alone, you may not find that pattern, patterns itself. So, so the combination makes it more powerful. And I think as the data is, is stored more on the cloud, you will see obviously a bigger value emerge as well. So. Great, great insight uh, and great question. Um, just, just two more questions here and we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, this one's for Ashish. Uh, is it possible for a non-Java engineer to work on big data and sustain in this field? If yes, then what are the competency skills that should be developed? Um, definitely, you know, I, I think big data used to be a field for Java engineers years back. Uh, you know, um, when we created Hive, that was the first step towards bringing big data towards SQL users. Now there are a lot of other technologies as well that further simplify uh, both SQL access and as well as uh, tool access to big data. So I think the, there are certain skills which don't change, which you need. You know, when you're dealing with data, you need to understand data. You need to have that skill set. You need to be able to uh, be able to derive insights out of the data, whether it is you know um, uh, you know statistical insights or uh, pattern insights and things like that. So those skills are still the same, but depending upon what type of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, what type of computation you are doing, I don't think language is an impediment uh, today. Uh, you know, there are still ways for improvement, but it was not. It's very the picture is very different from you know uh, six seven years back when uh, this whole thing was primarily a, a, a place where you had to be a Java developer or write Java programs to really get hold of data. But now we have you know, people with uh, stats uh, background, people with SQL background, people uh, you know, learning you know, uh, with you know, packages like R and uh, you know, machine learning packages, and all of them are able to use uh, big data infrastructure without having to be a Java programmer, and that is this is very central to Kubo's vision also, and it is central to the entire uh, big data community's vision as well. How to simplify access uh, to big data um, in a way that uh, yeah, you know you know with your uh, with the skills uh, that you have, language skills that you have, you can also get access to the same uh, processing power. Uh, then it becomes boils down to what kind of other mathematical or pattern matching skills you have around data to really derive insights. Great, that's tremendous insight. Um, we've got one last question and we're kind of up against it on time, but let's see if we could get a pretty quick answer on this one and I'll open it up to either of you two. And it simply asks, can you share your thoughts on the role of or importance of hybrid cloud? So um, you want me to go first, Noel? Yeah, yeah, please. Sure. So I think hybrid cloud uh, to us is uh, a point. is a It's a temporal phenomenon. Uh, you know, for you know, we really think that the economies of scale that a you know public cloud drives uh, is huge. As a result, uh, you know, there's always going to be a case for a hybrid cloud. There's always going to be certain. Uh, uh, reasons why, uh, through which uh, you would you know want to keep uh, you know certain uh, things in a private cloud whether it is because you have already made certain investments or whether 
uh, it is because there are certain regu regulatory, uh, you know, geographic regulatory uh, constraints saying that, okay, if you are in this jurisdiction, your data has to reside in this jurisdiction and so on and so forth. But over a period of time, I think a lot more things will migrate to the public cloud. And uh, during that transition, hybridity becomes important. I think the end goal will probably look much more different from the world today where public cloud dominates uh, and, you know, uh, private cloud becomes a smaller part uh, of the picture. Yeah, and I think I agree with that, that you actually have to have, a, against a combination of the strategy where you may want to get the best of the best uh, worlds, you know, depending on how your application and architectures and compliances uh, make up the, the environment. But definitely, you know, public clouds are a bit um, advantages were, were private because the fact that you can go, uh, as we discussed, the faster time to value, the lower cost, which makes it a lot uh, appealing to customers. For, so I think the newer applications and newer insights uh, are where I think we are heading towards the public cloud more so than the private, just because the fact that it's got more you know, easier and faster uh, and time to value uh, essence, you know. Great. Fantastic. And that covers our Q&A session and our presentation. Um, again, a tremendous thank you to both Noel and Ashish, and of course to you folks for tuning in. Uh, we've got fantastic webinars going on every month, so please stay tuned for our next one. I actually know about the next one. I can't tell you about it, but I know that it's actually a really good one, and you'll be hearing about it uh, very soon. So thank you again to everyone. We really appreciate it. Have happy holidays, and we will speak to you guys soon. Take care.